Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. A large part of becoming a parent, I have learned, and I think I could say my wife has also learned, is learning how to survive as a parent. And the ability to survive comes in large part from your ability to relearn things you thought you already understood. Children have a funny way of changing your understanding of things. So I've come to learn that surviving as a parent, you have to learn to live in a new reality. For example, before I became a parent, I thought I knew exactly how much sleep I needed to be functional. After becoming a parent, I've had to relearn that. Oh, I still need the amount of sleep I did before to be functional. I've just had to redefine what it means to be functional. Turns out you don't need as much sleep mainly because your whole definition of what it means to be functional throughout the day changes when you have kids. Before I became a parent, I also thought that peace and quiet was something that I wanted. You have children, and then you realize, no, I just want peace. Quiet can make you very nervous as a parent. Perhaps the biggest adjustment that I have had to make as a parent is learning how to redefine what it means to be clean and organized. I'll never forget when my daughter Elizabeth was two years old. She had this habit of every time we asked her to clean something up, She would pretend like she was sleeping immediately, even laying down on the floor and closing her eyes. I happen to be a clean freak by nature, but having children has forced me to reevaluate that definition, and there is no more clean and there is no more organized. There is simply just clean enough and organized enough. When Scripture talks about sin and righteousness and salvation, It often talks about it using these terms of cleanliness and filthiness. One of those examples is in Psalm 51. King David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me. I shall be whiter than snow. I'm sure you've heard it said that cleanliness is next to godliness. And although I would have a propensity to agree with that and understand and appreciate the sentiment, the truth is we could never scrub hard enough. We could never scrub hard enough even to make our cleanliness come next to godliness. No, there is not enough soap, there is not enough detergent or hot water in the world that can in any way remove the stain of sin that has marred us. There are not enough good works that could be done that could outweigh the guilt of our sin. This is why David cried out to God. He asked God to wash him because David knew he couldn't do it himself. Even on his best day, If David didn't know, he would come to learn that even my most righteous deeds, as Isaiah said, are like filthy rags. If we have any hope of being truly cleansed in our conscience, of being confident of standing before an almighty God at the end of our life, then that hope of being cleansed and righteous doesn't come from us. That comes from us from him. The good news of the gospel is that we have not been left to clean up ourselves. God did not look down on a sinful world and declare, I'm willing to come down there and clean you up, but why don't you meet me halfway? You clean yourself up enough and I'll come and finish the job. No, instead, God sent John the Baptist to cry out to our world to do the opposite, to repent. To cry out to God and say, we can't. 
You have to do it, Lord. God sent John the Baptist to point to Jesus, his perfect son, and to say about Jesus, Behold, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God sent his son born in human flesh to be the human we were supposed to be, to live the righteous life before God of faithfulness we have failed to do, and in his perfection to carry those sins of ours to the cross and to pay the debt we owe God, which is a debt of death. When the people came out to see John the Baptist to be baptized by him in the river Jordan, they came out because they heard that message. Repent, turn around, God is here. Your only hope is to confess your need for mercy and grace. That was the message of John the Baptist. And so it's significant then that Jesus shows up also in response to that message. The Messiah, the Holy One of God, the one whom angels worship and adore, comes down to the river Jordan where all these people are confessing their sins, their wickedness, polluting the water. And Jesus shows up. And he doesn't tell John to stop. He doesn't bring an end to repentance. No, he just walks down right into the middle of it. Into that water of the Jordan now swirling with people's sins confessed. And John didn't miss the significance of that. God had revealed to John who Jesus was. And it wasn't right that this Son of God is now walking down into this water where I've been telling people to repent and they've been confessing their wickedness. Why are you here, Jesus? That's exactly what John the Baptist said. I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, saying, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Let us do so now. Depending upon your translation, I prefer, I think it's the New King James that says, Suffer it to be so. I know you don't like this, John. I know it doesn't seem right that I am here to be baptized. But that's the only way I'm going to fulfill all righteousness. Not his righteousness. Jesus wasn't a sinner. No, he came down into that river of sin to fulfill our righteousness. Came into those waters to be baptized, to identify with us, to soak up that sin and carry it to the cross so that God could treat him in our place. As 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's what Jesus did when he declared from the heavens, This is my Son with whom I am well pleased. I have made him to be your sacrifice. He has put on your sin, and I'm pleased with him, so he's the one worthy to take those sins you confessed and bury him. Because Jesus was baptized for righteousness, we can be baptized into righteousness. As we read in Romans 6, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. See, for our baptism to mean anything, Jesus had to do it first. In order for anything to mean anything, he has to do it first. And so because he received the Holy Spirit in his baptism, because that Spirit rested upon Jesus, so too we can have the confidence that in baptism, that's where we know we have received that Spirit of God. We don't have to rely on an emotion or a feeling. No, we can rely on what Jesus said about baptism and what happened to him in baptism. 
As Peter said in the first Christian sermon preached in Acts chapter 2, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. That's what Jesus meant when he said to fulfill all righteousness. If I'm not baptized, there's no point to you being baptized. But because Jesus was faithful to his Father, to identify himself with sinners, we can have the confidence that the Spirit of God is within us because of baptism. Because Jesus was confirmed as the Son of God in baptism, Because God declared through baptism Jesus to be his son, so too by faith in Christ, that is where we are made to be sons and daughters of God. As Galatians 3 says, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You see, it's all over the scriptures. This is where our hope can be found. Not because it's magic water, not because it's some rite of the church, but because that's where God desires to give us the assurance and confidence that we have been cleansed. Because he says so, that word in the water, that we are marked as his. That no matter what happens, we know we're saved, not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done to us and for us. Because the heavens opened at Jesus' baptism, so too has heaven opened for all who are baptized and believe in him. As Colossians 2 says, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Heaven's yours. How do you know that? Well, because you believe the words of Christ that we just read when it says you were already raised with him in baptism. A dirty rag cannot clean a dirty mess. A sinner cannot rid themselves of sin. Baptism is not something that we do. It's not our work. It's the work of God, the work of his word, with the water. As 1 Peter chapter 3 says very plainly, baptism now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Here's the good news that all of this means and what I hope you take away from this. God did not wait for you to clean yourself up before he died for you. It's an amazing grace because to our broken and limited understanding, God's grace doesn't just seem right that he would do this and I don't owe him anything. But no, as a baptized infant, God's grace in full was given to you. Not because you deserved it, but because it was already paid for on the cross before you were even born. The words Jesus spoke to Peter are true for us. You shall never wash my feet, Peter said to Jesus. But Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. The good news is we have been washed. We have been cleansed by that same Lord, that same baptized Jesus. And the words that he heard from the Father, we now share in being baptized into Christ. He is well pleased with us because of who we put our faith in. As it says in Titus 3, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal 
of the Holy Spirit. Amen.